Okay, I'd like to begin with the history of the temple. Huh? Right. So the temple was founded by this gentleman here, shown in the picture, Mr. A. Augustine Gilles de Alvis. Okay, Mr. Alvis uh, is a well-known person actually among the Sinhalese community uh, of Malaya for his immense philanthropy and contributions to the de development of Buddhism in early Malaya. Okay, Mr. Alvis came to Taiping from Ceylon. Actually, he was brought down by the British government to work at the Perak State government printing press in 1888. At that time, Perak was the uh, most important state in the uh, Strait Settlements. And uh, most of the, uh, the government machinery was uh, done at the, was based at, in Taiping. So in the old days, Taiping was such an important town and it was the capital of Perak. And also it was the place where they built the first railway line that was constructed in Malaya. Okay, that's Mr. Alvis. And uh, much of the history that we know of uh, our temple comes from this newspaper article that Mr. Alvis uh, that was written in 1940, first September 1940. That's a year before Mr. Alvis passed away. Okay, so the article here is uh, we have uh, this actually this old article that uh, newspaper that we had for a long time, and uh, and we managed to. Uh, uh, get most of this uh, copy of this through the Singapore libraries. They have, they had a clear copy of it. So this is the clear copy of it. And it's quite an interesting account of what Malaya was in those old early days, no? Uh, so he came uh, to Malaya and the first thing that he did realize was uh, Malaya did not have, Taiping did not have a place of worship for the, for the Buddhists of Taiping. So the following year in 1889, he bought a piece of land in Assam Pumbang. That's near the railway station, the current railway station, and uh, where most of the people, singlies of that time were working. They lived around, the, they worked in the railways and they lived around the railway station at that time. So he built this first temple in that, in that area. So the land that Mr. Alvis bought is uh, shown in that lot 347, that's the green and the uh, brown plot. Okay, the two adjacent plots colored in green and brown are plots that Mr. Alvis bought to build the temple. Upon purchase, this, the set uh, plots were amalgamated into a single plot and called lot 347. So that's how this our temple gets a, a number lot 347. Okay, on the pictures, the two pictures on the right, for historical interest, we have preserved the original save, survey department stones on the ground that demarcated the two plots of land before it was amalgamated. See the two, uh, where it's pointed out with the arrows, huh? Okay, to start the temple, Mr. Alvis built a small vihara on the land in 1889. The vihara was the first functional stru structure that was built on the land, okay? For that reason, based on this historical record, we are adopted 1889 as the date in which Bodhi Lankaram was started, 1889, okay? This makes Bodhi Lankaram the first Sri Lankan Buddhist temple in Malaya. Okay, then um, the said Vihara was rebuilt at the same location. Now you see that picture there in brick and mortar and was completed around 19, 1904. The picture of the shrine marked with an arrow shows the said shrine. Later on, a front porch was added to it. Okay, this is another important aspect of our temple, okay? In 1890, Mr. Alvis brought a singlist Buddhist monk from Ceylon to be the resident monk of the temple. His name is Reverend Gala Nagoda Tissero Pera. Unfortunately, we don't have a picture of uh, Reverend Gala Nagoda Tissero, okay? But he was a very highly acclaimed monk. He was as the vested with the title of Padia, meaning a high priest able to conduct ordination of monks. It's also said that uh, Reverend Krisaro received the highest honors bestowed to a monk by the King of Thailand at that time. So it was very popular and very well known. Okay, the picture on the left is a small pagoda, and that's where we have the remains of Venerable Krisaro uh, in that little pagoda. So this uh, newspaper cutting of uh, demise of Reverend Krisaro, which states that he died at the age of 90 in uh, on 24th June, 1940. Okay, he has, he served 
uh, our temple for 50 years until he passed away at the age of 90. Uh, this uh, the one, the picture on the left is a government, Perak State Government Gazette. Okay, the Perak Government Gazette that ex exempt our society. We had to take, in 1895, Mr. Alvis formed a society called the Dalmodia Society to look after and manage the development of the temple and the propagation of Buddhism. The picture on the left is a Para government gazette that ex exempts the Dalmodia Society from registration. From our knowledge, in those days, in those times, in order to monitor the activities of triads, societies uh, were required by law to register so that they can be monitored. So we had the exemption. It was, a, it was a gazette by the Parag government at that time. Membership in Dhammoda society was exclusively, exclusively Similis, as the temple was run by Similis Buddhists. The Dhammoda society underwent two name changes over the years. You can see that on the, uh, the, the, the illustration on the right. After the war, in 1945, it was renamed Taiping Buddhist Association a name better understood and representative of all the Buddhist communities in Taiping. See, after the war, I think the, the Taiping became, uh, was patronized by almost everybody from in Taiping. There were the, what, the Thais, the Burmese, the Chinese, and everybody started to come to the temple. So uh, the society at that time wanted to get more people involved so they, they and in the society, and so they adopted a name called Taiping Buddhist Association which is an association of all the places, you know. In 1976, it was renamed Taiping Bodhi Lankaram Buddhist Association to better reflect on the name of the temple. Okay, so in 1976, we did that. So today we are known as Taiping Bodhi Lankaram Buddhist Association. In 1996, we registered a subsidiary called the Taiping Buddha Dhamma Society for the better propagation of uh, Buddhism among the Buddhists of Taiping. Under its able president, retired Captain Y. Seng Mo, the society took the Dhamma activities of the temple to a higher level. They also started a Sunday Dhamma class for our young. The Bo Taiping Buddha Dhamma Society undertook to re uh, remodel the temple grounds and erect new structures for public convenience. Not long after, all the members of the Buddha Dhamma Society uh, members were amalgamated into our parent society, the Taiping Bodhi Lankaram Association, and so the Buddha Dhamma Society was dissolved. So we only have one uh, society, and that's our society and temple are proclaimed in the Perak State Government Gazette and are registered with the Register of Societies. Okay, and the next important point is that we're about our venerable Bodhi. Uh, we use the word venerable Bodhi, or in English we call the Bodhi Nans here. Right. Okay, this is a picture of pictures of our here are pictures of our, our venerable body and the surrounding area from different angles. <clears throat> As you can see that's a it's quite a, a pretty sight where you have a look at it. Huh? This is a side view of the venerable body. The venerable body is surrounded by a double wall terrace, and at the front entrance is a shrine. These are Two close up views of our venerable body. The venerable body is well attended and carefully looked after as it has been for the last 25, 129 years, with no overgrowth of parasites or sephrophytes on the trunks and trees. So we really take care of our uh, venerable body very well. So it's, it's the oldest documented temple in the in Taiping. This is a close-up view from the front of the terrace with a canopy that covers the shrine area of the Bodhi. Devotees circumambulate the venerable Bodhi using the double wall terrace. You can see the arrows in the direction in which we circumambulate the temple. Okay. At the front of it is a, at the front of the Bodhi is a Bodhi shrine where the covered canopy with the, under the canopy canopy where we conduct our prayers and meditation. This is our front portion. Okay, this is a story of our uh, Venerable Bodhi. Eh? In 1892, Mr. Alvis sent Venerable Pissero to Ceylon to bring back a sapling of, from the sea 
Chaya Sri Mahabodhi from Anuradhapura. Based on history, the great venerable Bodhi at Jaya Sri Mahabodhi Viharya in Anuradhapura, Sri Lanka is a sapling of the great Bodhi in Bodh Gaya, India. As documented in the archives of the Jaya Sri Mahabodhi Viharya, uh, a sampling was presented by venerable to venerable Kisaro by the incumbent chief monk of Jaya Sri Mahabodhi Viharya, venerable Akurasa Daminda Mahatera in 1892. So it's documented in, in, the, in Sri Lanka that the uh, sapling was presented to us. The venerated sapling was brought back to typing and planted in front of the Vihara amid much pomp and splendor on the Vesak full moon day of 1893. So that's a long time ago. Okay. The venerable Bodhi is the oldest documented sapling of the Jaya Sri Mahabodhi to be planted in Malaya. The temple was then named Bodhi Lanka Ram in honor of the great venerable Bodhi sapling. So that's how we got our temple name. The Venerable Bodhi has in his 129 years history provided solace, happiness, and deliverance to devotees who have come to pray at, at Bodhi Lankaram. We have numerous enchanting stories from all the years of sightings of floating bright lights around our Venerable Bodhi. This was also reported to me by my father, grandfather, and a lot of my relatives. We are the guardians of the Venerable Bodhi and we pay homage to our great Venerable Bodhi. And here's uh, uh, the history of our, we have got uh, this, this stone inlaid uh, about the history of our temple and uh, from, from the beginning, from before the body was planted. Okay, it's there inlaid. If you go to the temple, you can see the, the history of our the venerable Bodhi. So getting back to the name Bodhi Lankaram, the word, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the temple was named in honor of the great venerable Bodhi sapling from Sri Lanka. Before independence, Sri Lanka was known as Ceylon, but in the singlish it was always referred to as Lanka. Okay, so and hence the word Lanka and its name. The word Ram means temple. Literally translated Bodhi Lankaram means Sri Lankan Buddhist temple with Bodhi tree from Sri Lanka. That's what it means. Okay. Yeah. Okay, now we come to the uh, some of the pictures from of the our Bodhi. The terrace around the Venerable Bodhi had gone through several renovations in its 129 year history. It started with a single brick wall around the Venerable Bodhi sapling to protect uh, sapling when it was first planted. So this is the terrace, you can see the terrace there. The picture on the left shows the original double brick wall terrace completed in 1905. And the one on the right shows an addition of a canopy at the shrine area. See, when the, the double brick wall was first completed, a commemoration stone on the top left there, you can see written in single text, was inlaid on the on the terrace, and that is dated uh, 1905. Then, in 1968, urgent, uh, urgent extensive repair works, together with beautification works, was carried out on the Bodhi terrace. Again, a commemoration stone was inlaid. So that's the one at the bottom, on the left bottom. And then, in 1997, uh, Buddha Dhamma Society carried out extensive works in uh, beautifying the uh, the terrace, our body terrace and the body site. And so they too laid a commemoration stone for that, for their work done. Around the outer perimeter of the body terrace, we have two shrines, okay? a Deva shrine and the other one's a Kuan Yin shrine, the Kuan Yin shrines on the left. As I mentioned earlier, the brick and mortar structure of the first Vihara was completed in 1904 at the original site near the Bodhi. Okay. And sometime in the 1930s, the plan to build a new Vihara was mooted. Based on temple records, the project to build a new Vihara was initiated through contributions of a single gentleman named Mr. Fernando, 
who was promoted to the post of station master of the Simpang railway station. The picture shows the vihara that was built and completed in 1934. You can see it's a simple vihara. It was styled according to Sri Lankan viharas with a terrace around the hall, which typically makes the sit down area small. The site chosen for the original Dharma Sala of the temple uh, was chosen and, as with the first Vihara. It faces east, this site. From then on, the first Vihara was used exclusively as the Sima for the monks. So Sima, that means the one that was built in the early years of uh, when the temple started, that was converted and used as a Sima from after the new Vihara was built. For the new Vihara, artisans were brought from Ceylon to sculpt a larger than life Buddha statue. This is the main Buddha statue of our temple. Uh, we also sculpted the statues of Arahat, Sariputta, that's the one on the left, Arahat Moggallana, and Bodhisattva Maitriya, as depicted as, as a deva on the right. So these are the four sculpted statues that were done since 1934. As the years went by, the footing of the Vihara completed in 1934, started the gift way. The committee under the presidency of late Mr. James Samra Sekar embarked to rebuild a new and much larger Vihara. But the retaining wall of the original Vihara was retained. The wall at the back of the original Buddha image. And around it, we built this new uh, structure. This is a picture of a new Vihara as it stands today. It's much, much larger than the one that we had. The new Vihara is much larger than the previous one. And so apart from pujas, we also conduct Dhamma discourses and meditation classes in the Vihara. Upon completion, of construction in an elaborate ceremony in June 1987, the new Vihara was consecrated by a Venerable Dr. Sri Dhammananda Mahathira and a host of Venerable Monks and declared open by Tato Paul Leong Ki Siong. As, as with all our structures, we inlaid a, uh, a stone to commemorate the event. These are pictures of the the statues in the Vihara. As I mentioned, on the left is Venerable Sar Arhat Sariputra, on the right is uh, Moggallana, and uh, on the far right is uh, Maitriya, Bod Bodhisattva Maitriya. This is a close up of the main Buddha statue. <laughs> then on the right, on the left of the temple, we have, on the right, sorry, we also have a small shrine of uh, Arhat Sivali, and on the left is a chamber in which our venerable Datu is kept, the one on the right. Datu Nansi is kept. Huh? Okay, the venerable Datu Nansi is, was presented to our temple by the Mahabodhi Society. It's a history of how we got our venerable Datu, okay? Presented by the Mahabodhi Society of India through the good office of our former resident monk, Bante Tri Pitaka Sri Niniwe Sumangla Terra. Bante, uh, Venerable Bante Sumangla was a graduate of in Buddhist archaeology and was an active and serving member of the Mahabodhi Society. These are close up pictures of the Venerable Datu, and on Vesak Day, the Venerable Datu is put on public display. So we, we, uh, we owe it to the Mahabodhi Society for giving us this uh, relic that we have, which it consists of two pieces. And every year on Besak morning, the Venerable Datu is taken on a grand tour, grand tour procession before it's publicly displayed. As you can see that we have all uh, uh, flag bearers and all our devotees uh, follow behind and uh, for our relic procession. And these are the other structures that were built that we have. On the left is our stupa. 
On the right is our bell post. Okay. All these, these structures that I mentioned earlier, were, except for the new Vihara, were built within the first 10 years of the founding of Bodhi Lankaran, meaning between 1889 and 1899. Okay. This, is a, this is a picture of our Dharma Sala and monks quarters, monks about them. They are in two buildings adjacent to each other, one in front and the other at the back. The original monks abode was at a different location, was relocated to the current location sometime after the war. Our original Bhagavad Sala teaching hall was also at a different location and was uh, built in 1957 to commemorate the Buddha Jayanti of uh, 2000 year celebration. The building at the front here, the front you can see that's the Dharma Sala. Next to it is a covered, uh, covered shed where we conduct our Sunday Dhamma classes and public activities. These are pictures inside the Dharma Sala. We have a small, sorry, we have a small shrine there, and this is the open area, and this is where we have our Dhamma discussions. When we have a small group, on, but when we have bigger groups, we do it in the uh, shrine hall. Okay, just to put things in perspective, this is where uh, the, the structures were. See, the, that's uh, the green box is where the land that we started this bought, and uh, the first shrine hall was 21C, and then subsequently uh, it became a SEMA, and then the uh, 21 D became our main shrine hall, and the uh, body tree is right there, at the right in front of 21 C. And all the other areas were where the important structures of a temple are located. Okay, now coming back, coming to the important part, the gazette transcripts. Okay, uh, ten years after, sorry, ten years after the temple was built, uh, Mr. Alvis decided to hand over the temple to the Karak state government to be gazetted as a Buddhist reserve. Okay, so that was in 1899, 10 years, exactly 10 years after. Okay, that's a trans transcript that's shown there. Okay, the important thing is here that I need to highlight here is the gazette names the temple reserve, reserve as Bodhi Lankaram and empowers the trustees of Bodhi Lankaram to be the trustees of the Buddhist reserve. So that was the first gazette. And below that, there's a schedule that outlines the area in which the temple was built. Okay, so you can see that uh, the blue box there, that's the area. And uh, after uh, it was extended with the addition of lot 522. Okay, and the whole area became uh, one acre, three roots, and 13 poles. The area when, when the first gazette was issued. Then in 1903, the land area of the temple was actually extended even more, and lot 542 was added to lot 347. So the total area of the temple reserve became three acres, two roots, and one pole. Okay, the whole area is shown in the green box there. Three acres, two roots, and one pole. Those, that, those are the early uh, years uh, measuring standards that they used. Okay, this is the second gazette, uh, the official gazette that mentions the same thing that the temple is uh, named Bodhi Lankaram and uh, it's uh, managed by the trustees of the entire property is the trustees of the temple called Bodhi Lankaram. Okay, I'd just like to add here, over the years, numerous false stories have sprouted about the founders of, and the trusteeship of Bodhi Lank of the temple reserve. So I hope the mentioned facts that, that will dispel any uh, false fabrications on this subject. So it's all clear that the uh, that we are the trustees of the state land. Now it comes to the part where the, our lineage of monks. Okay, I've mentioned earlier our first monk was uh, Venerable uh, Kisarova. 
he was served our temple for 50 years. And after he passed away, his assistant, Venerable Sarananda, took over. And he was from 1938 to 1962. Sorry. And after Venerable Sarananda left, we had Venerable Mangala, who was there uh, for in the 60s, and then followed by the other monks. Okay, the monk that I wish to highlight here is uh, Venerable Sri Sumangala Thera. Okay, so let's see. That's the monk sitting on the right. Okay, Venerable uh, Sumangala, it was during when I was uh, active in the temple, it was instrumental in the formation of the Buddha Dhamma Society and the rebuilding of the Vihara, the current Vihara that we have, and for bringing the Venerable Datu to our temple through the, uh, uh, the society that is affiliated with. Those are the other monks that I've got pictures of. The one on uh, top is Sarananda, then the Mangala and Sivali. Okay, I also wish to mention that the late chief high priest of Malaya, Venerable K. Sri Dr. Dambananda Mahathira, was our religious advisor throughout his tenure as the chief priest of Malaya, Malaysia. Uh, Venerable chief officiated at all our significant events, assisted and advised us in our religious activities and the running of the temple. He was a pillar, what, a pillar of strength and support for our temple. And these are the list of past presidents that we had. Okay. Uh, when this is the 40 years I've been with the temple, these are the presidents that I've, uh, I've been with, uh, starting with Mr. James and our current president, Mr. Unchunan. Okay. Uh, so we had uh, quite a few presidents in the 40 years that I was being in the temple. I was a serving president also at that time. I would like to mention here uh, Miss Jessie Pereira. She's probably the only uh, lady president that we had. Okay. Um, she served as office bearer of the committee for more than 60 years. She was with the temple for more than 60 years in her lifetime. In her tenure as president, she was instrumental in the formation of Buddha Dharma Society and later the amalgamation of its members to the parent society. Yeah. So I keep mentioning about Buddha Dharma Society is because uh, the Buddha Dharma Society actually brought a lot of good change to the temple and progress. Okay, down memory lane, here yeah, are some photographs from the past. These are actually my own family people. I see my grandmother and uncle there and some other people there. Okay, this was a picture taken in 1949. Most of the pictures we have are from Vesak. As you can see, it's quite well gaily decorated even in then. Huh? And this is a picture of our devotees, civilist devotees who were at the temple. At that time, my father is there, and all this is probably uh, in the late 50s to early 40s, uh, probably uh, early uh, 50s. Sorry, this picture. Yeah. And this is a picture of uh, another picture during Vesak. This is probably in the early 60s. And this is another picture in 1966, also during Vesak. You notice there's a bird cage there. In those days, it was uh, popular for to release birds. It was a practice among all Buddhist temples to release birds. And eventually, they did away with that because uh, people used to go out and catch birds and sell it to the temples, sell it to the people so that they can release the birds, which was not a very ethical practice. So it was stopped in all of the temples in Malaysia. In 1960, 1960s, I remember when I was young, we had a young Canadian who was ordained as a monk in our temple. Okay, this monk was ordained by our chief, late chief, uh, Dr. Damananda Thera. Okay, and he, they gave him a name after his own name. So he was given a name, Piananda. There you can see some devotees giving him alms. And it was a big uh, memorable occasion for us because we had not seen an ordination. I've not seen an ordination at that time. Okay? Here's a picture of the uh, of the, after the ordination taken at our Bodhi tree, an old picture. The important uh, events that we celebrate at our, our temple. Okay, these are the major events that we celebrate. Huh? Uh, New Year's Day blessings, 
Chinese New Year's Day blessings, Vesak, Patidana, and Katina. So these are the main uh, religious events that we celebrate at our temple. Okay, New Year's Day blessings, so as usual, our members uh, come on the, the, what, uh, New Year's Day Eve. Okay, these are, these are pictures from 2019. I don't get me wrong, it's not from 2020 where we had the MCOs and all. Okay, so our, our devotees come to the temple and they light up lamps and uh, and beautify the temple. Okay, and uh, throughout the day, uh, our devotees come and they observe the do dhanas of pujas at the Bodhi and all that. As you can see, uh, on 1st of January, we have a, a big puja for all the devotees to come and attend. That's Venerable Maitri on the right. So all of them come and chant at the Bodhi tree and be blessed for the New Year, for blessings. So in 2019, this is our uh, Chinese New Year puja and blessings that we had. Of course, it was also the, uh, uh, this is before the MCU, okay? So, so in 2019, one of the things that we do is, uh, devotees come and light, apart from lighting the temple grounds, they also buy an oil lamp in memory of their late parents or, or, or for their own well being. That usually what is, uh, the light lamps signify. Uh, you can see them lighting the uh, temple grounds. So this is, and uh, we have blessing services throughout the day for Chinese New Year. And then uh, our devotees offer dana to the monks who are residing at the temple on Chinese New Year Day. And another common practice is uh, we use the, we have uh, dragon dances to that in front of our important areas of veneration. You can see the one in our Vihara, one in front of our late uh, Kisaros stupa, and also at the Bodhi. Okay, in the year 2020 and 2021, we could not do Vesak. I'm sure you're aware of that. So we did Vesak online. This is our monk, uh, resident monk, Venerable Maitri, who actually did a splendid job in. Uh, for Vesak, although no, we were not allowed to do it, like, you know, I mean, we, we did it in a, uh, one by uh, Reverend Maitri on his own. He did it with one or two of our devotees and under strict uh, as, uh, under SOP rules. Uh, so he set up the place. I just put these pictures here to show you all what uh, what was a sorry it was such a delightful thing that we did, you know, and all of us watched it from Zoom. So these are the pictures. See, he lit up the candles and all was quite a quite a sight. So it was Pesak day, and although we were not there, uh, we did our part. And all those who contributed to our temple, who bought a lamp, were given the opportunity to watch and see what we have done. It's quite a beautiful sight. Here, there's a full picture of it. Okay, so now I'm going to say about Pesak uh, 2022 the one that we just celebrated it was such a huge delight for us to celebrate Vesak in 2022 after two years of not being able to do so. So as usual, Vesak starts with housekeeping, house, housekeeping, it is spring cleaning. So our devotees come together over two Sundays and also we get a lot of, a lot of help from school kids in typing. They come and clean up the whole temple, scrape up all the walls and repaint the area. And it's such a wonderful gathering of uh, family and friends, you know. As you can see, this picture there, we wash toilets, we clean up the dust and everything. And uh, it's actually us devotees doing it, not hired labor or anything. You know? So actually, we all come together and do it. Yeah, you see, they are busy washing, cleaning. And our wonderful monk is there to assist. And these are pictures of Vesak Day of 2022. As usual, we have the Pradipa Puja and lighting oil lamps. That's always the, the main thing. We always try to purify our temple grounds for Vesak. And we have, this year we had three months 
from uh, uh, two from Tentu, um, and our regular monk uh, who is here with us. So over the years, we have been getting uh, as we don't we don't usually have uh, uh, resident monks in our temple. If ever we have, we have one of the monk. And for Vesak, we need more than one monk. So at this, we call in two monks. And I would, I would like to thank uh, both our chief, Venerable Dato Damaratna, no, Damaratna Mahathera and Venerable Sarnan Aikathera for the support they have given us over the years in, when we needed monks, you know, for Katina, for Vesak, or whenever we want to do any special blessings. They always sent us monks. And I understand that the, this last, uh, the last year was there were too few monks, there were none, and um, but still two came, so we were actually quite delighted with the whole uh, Vesak celebration with these three monks that we had. Okay, the Vesak morning always starts with the Pindapata, and then after the Pindapata, we have the Buddha Puja. So you can see that as you can see in the pictures, the monks are on the Pindapata, and then after that, uh, we do the Buddha Puja. Okay, then the most important event for the day, Vesak is the day where we take our Buddha relics on procession. Every year, three of our devotees are given the privilege to carry the Buddha relic. Okay, you can see the three gentlemen there. Okay, leading up to the uh, uh, procession day, where they have to carry the Buddha relic, they have they usually okay, they are, they are uh, encouraged to observe the eight precepts for in detail for for a certain period of time, then they're given the opportunity to carry the relics. It's quite a grand procession, by the way. Yeah. That's all, and they are followed with, by our devotees uh, at the back with their offerings of flowers and all that. And then finally, the Buddha relic is uh, placed in a special chamber. The relic is actually embedded, is uh, placed in a in a golden casket that we have, you can see the arrow here, then it's open and it's exposed here. And it's open for from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. on Vesak day, only once a year we do that. And that's a picture of Noondana offerings, the Sangha. And then uh, there is another thing that's uh, quite a prominent uh, feature in our temple is we, can, we provide food they have been providing food for more than 100 years to devotees who have come to our temple. So here we see a, a, a food being cooked by a family of Indians, uh, Indian devotees of ours, okay? They have been supporting us. So the, the, the special mention, like you can see there, they cook up 3,000 meals. And for more than a decade, they have been serving 3,000 meals on Vesak day to all our devotees. Okay, and like I said earlier, this has been a practice in our temple for more than 100 years. And everybody comes to our temple knowing that on Vesak day, uh, they only not only can come, they not only come to pray, they also come and uh, share in the food that uh, we give to everyone who visits. Okay, so a special mention of Mr. and Mrs. Chandran, his wife name is Shanti who has been with us for more than a decade, serving over 3,000 meals on this day. And also our committee, our society also serves likewise over 3,000 meals. So we serve out about 6,000 meals on this day. And most of, the, most of our devotees come together and they cook the food and bring it to the temple to be served. The highlight of Vesak day is actually the Dhamma Chakra Pavatana Sutra on the night of Vesak. That's the time where we actually all gather to listen to the Dhamma Chakra Pavatana Sutra. As you can see that you all, in spite of the fact that uh, there was no there's SOP, no SOP rules, but we all sat far apart and observed Vesak uh, in our Vihara. Okay, so that's the time where we all sit back and listen. That's the last event for the day. And uh, such a nice, clarifying time to sit down and listen uh, to the Dhamma Chakra. Yeah. The cycle of the Dhamma Chakra. And that's a picture of our temple on Vesak Day. It's, we light up the temple and make it really beautiful, like a fairy land. 
we all come together and do this. Another next major event on the seventh lunar month of Chinese, of the Chinese calendar, we have the Patidana. I'm sure you know what Patidana is, right? It's uh, where we, uh, we provide dana for the eat, uh, uh, in memory of or to spirits that are lost. And we do this at our Bodhi tree. So this is what our devotees will come and they'll uh, conduct the Patidana for itself. This is all our devotees here. And finally, uh, the most, uh, most important, second most important event that we have is the Katina. Okay, Katina starts in the month of Islam month of uh, July, where we invite a uh, monk, or may, well, we, we even had more than one monk, uh, to observe the wasp period in our temple. Okay, you can see here, uh, uh, the, the details are for the invitation that we do. So this is the pictures that I have of Katina 2019. That was before the MCO and all that, okay? Okay, as you can see there, our devotees start the day uh, carrying the Katina Shivara in an elaborate procession. That's the second procession that we have every year. The first was the uh, Datu Nansi, and this is the Katina Shivara. So uh, we actually have at least a few sponsors to uh, Katina. And, um, the main sponsors, they actually take care of the uh, temple for the three month period of our uh, observing monk. And they are given the opportunity to carry the uh, Katina Shivara and around the temple. You can see those three ladies there. Then the procession is followed by devotees uh, offering to the Sangha. And okay, they, are, they bring their own offerings to the temple and to the Sangha. We have a very systematic way of presenting uh, our offerings. We have uh, many, many visiting monks who come to assist us with, uh, on Katina Day. You can see they're seated on the far left there, and we all take turns to present our uh, offerings to the temple and to the Mahasangha. This is uh, a ceremony that was carried out okay, uh, to the uh, Maitri received the Katina Shivra the year 2019. We have been uh, doing the Katina presentation ceremony in our own temple since 2017, which is a great thing for us because we were deprived of actually doing that from, for many, many years, for over 60 to 70 years here. And after the Shivra is presented, the, 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 it's dyed in a saffron orange robe. All our devotees get together and do that. And then they spread it to dry it up. Then they cut them to pieces, and our own devotees will stitch them and sew them to make the cutable cutting roots. So that's actually a, a real grand occasion for us cutting. Yeah. The okay, other activities that we have uh, frequently are meditation classes. Okay, we have occasionally, once in a while, we have visiting monks who come to our temple and conduct meditation classes in our temple. So we send out the word to people of typing and, and just as many as they can, they'll come and attend our classes. The other thing that we have is Dhamma dis discourses. Yeah, these two sadhus were we came to our temple and uh, they conducted a Dhamma discourse in our temple. This is just one of them. We probably have about five or six uh, visiting uh, teachers who come to our temple, I mean, uh, and give, uh, conduct the discourses in our temple. So this is just one of one session that we had. Then of course, the other important thing is our community service educare program. Okay, we participated in the educare program of uh, organized by the Sri Lanka Buddhist Temple uh, of Sanctum. And that really was a very, these are really gratifying uh, uh, community service projects that we have done. You know? So all of us feel really good about it. We go all out, raise funds, buy as many bags as we can. And of course, we also get a lot of support from uh, Central Buddhist Temple. And we reach out to as many 
kids as we can, irrespective of uh, race or beliefs or anything. And we usually get this uh, one or two VIPs to present to the kids so that our activities are known. And the things that we present are school books, school bags, and uniforms to deserving primary school students to give them a good start in the new year, in the new school year. That's them all happy. And uh, some of them also receive some on for for uh, to start them off well. Right? So I'd like to thank, we'd like to thank the uh, uh, Central Buddhist Temple for the support and give, for giving us the opportunity to conduct the Educare program with them. I think we have been doing it for quite a few years. And finally, we come to our aspirations as a Buddhist temple. Okay, these are our aspirations which have, we have uh, crafted out for you to see. To continue our quest in furthering the teachings of the Dhamma through learning and practice. Okay, that's been our quest from ever since actually. Uh, that's why we have uh, the meditation classes and we invite speakers and uh, meditation about the uh, and conduct the Dhamma discourses classes in our temple to provide the best amenities and support for the Sangha and our devotees. All right? So we, we, the monies that are donated to our temple uh, are very well uh, taken care of and, and directed in the right direction for the benefit of our monks. We take care of them in every possible way with health, insurance, everything. And uh, we try to upgrade our amenities in the temple. Although we are not much of a big temple, but we still get a good amount of uh, uh, money, especially during Vesak and Katuna, which helps us to uh, to keep our temple in good order. And of course, uh, to be actively involved in community service. And uh, like I said earlier, the Educare program is one of the programs that we uh, do our best for the young kids. And sometimes we also, do some some donations to uh, homes or to individuals who need money. That's when, especially when we have access to like, And of course, this is the future great, but aspiration of ours to make Bodhi Lankaram a beautiful garden temple with well structured areas of veneration where devotees can come and pray, learn, and practice the Dhamma and meditate while being close to nature. But that's our dream that's going to cost us a lot, but definitely we're working towards that direction. Okay, thank you very much for, for listening in. Uh, I'd like to once again thank our organizers for the opportunity that they have given us. And I hope that all of you will one day be passing through Taiping to come to our temple and at least pay us a visit and get a, get a better view of our temple and know more about our temple. <laughs>